Uh, also from rate setting, we have Grace Williams, who is one of uh, our three uh, rate setting staff, and Lori Bailey, who is another. Uh, uh, Dwayne Parsons, the, our third, is not with us right now because uh, he has to homeschool his kid due to COVID between uh, at this time every day. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, Sarah? Hello, I am Sarah Grant, uh, Director of Communications for Main Care Services. Great, and I think that we can um, keep it at that unless there are other main care folks who want to pipe up, um, but I wanna respect our time today. Um, Julia, should I go to you next for Myers and Stafford? Yes, good afternoon. I'm Julia Kachiever and I'm a senior manager with Myers and Stauffer. Um, and also with me is Jillian um, Kuther, who will be managing the mute and unmute. So you'll hear a lot um, about her because she will have all the power today um, to mute and unmute select people. That is a lot of power. All right, so that is it for um, introductions. Um, first off, I will just give everybody a refresh for the refresh on the work that we are uh, embarking on and why. Peter, if you could move to the next slide. Uh, so we have been talking about and very excited about this work for some time now. Um, we know that main care's current reimbursement system is quite complex. Um, it's hard to keep track of um, for us at main care, uh, say nothing for the state as a whole and for providers um, as well. And uh, we felt that we really needed a comprehensive evaluation of the system. Uh, one, so that we can ensure that the rates we pay for services are sufficient to make sure that um, members have access to critical services through their providers. Uh, we also are interested in creating a system that is more uh, consistent and streamlined uh, and uh, easier to understand and to administer. So those are, are really our, our big goals with this project. Next slide. Uh, so just to level set, uh, we are going to have two rounds of stakeholder engagement. This is the first round. Uh, during this round, we are specifically here to hear your input regarding the impact of our reimbursement methodologies um, on uh, providers and uh, your administrative uh, functions, uh, as well as any impacts on the members that you serve. Uh, during our second round of stakeholder engagement, um, we at that point will have our what we've been calling our benchmarking report, which is going to look at what we pay for main care services and compare um, rates with rates for comparable services uh, that are paid by other state Medicaid agencies, by Medicare, and by commercial payers. Uh, we will have that report in hand and, and then we will uh, engage with stakeholders again um, to get your input on the actual uh, amount of the rates that we reimburse for services. Um, and that is also when we would like input uh, on access to services as it relates to those reimbursement amounts. Um, so we know that there's been a lot of attention around the amount of the rates that we pay and we understand that and we are absolutely making that a priority for this project, but we are starting off the work focused on uh, the rate methodologies. Um, and so we ask that you save your comments on actual rate amounts for that second round of engagement. Um, and we will ask, uh, we will uh, kindly ask, redirect you if you if you start bringing up uh, rate amounts during this session, just because we wanna make sure we stay focused and uh, capture your comments. Um, uh, on these topics specifically. I think I covered those uh, talking points. So um, thanks, Peter. Oh, I did also want to note um, that uh, we will be accepting written submission of comments as well. So if you think of something later or if you have 
comments that you really just feel more comfortable sharing and writing, um, then uh, you will be able to do so. Um, I will just note that some questions have come up today uh, regarding whether um, those comments uh, will be publicly available um, or if it will just be a summary of comments. Um, we are checking in with our department privacy folks to see if there are certain things that we have to share um, or not, and we'll be uh, getting out more guidance um, shortly on that topic along with a due date um, for uh, when those written comments will be due. Uh, I also um, am probably going out of order here, but I did want to make sure that everybody is aware as we put out in writing ahead of time that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, we are also going to transcribe the recordings to make sure that we are accurately capturing everybody's comments as well. Next slide, please. All right, so switching gears a little bit, uh, since we asked you questions about value-based purchasing, and uh, that is something that not everybody talks about on a daily, daily basis, um, we wanted to spend just a little bit of time uh, level setting on what we mean by value-based purchasing. And so where I always find it helpful to start um, is to actually define what we mean by value, because it's something that we throw around a lot, um, but don't necessarily define on a regular basis. And so um, I, what I like about the term value is that by definition, it's talking about quality of care provided or services provided, as well as cost. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that you can improve value. Um, if, I mean, there's a lot of different ways, but to oversimplify it, you can think about if I'm holding quality constant, the way I improve value is by reducing the cost. Uh, if I'm holding the cost constant, constant, the way I improve value is by improving the quality. Uh, and so again, very oversimplified, but those are the, the levers that we're talking about. And so with a fee-for-service fee system, um, we are just paying based on volume and quality uh, does not come into the equation. Um, and so that relationship between quality and cost uh, doesn't really exist under a fee-for-service system in terms of how we reimburse for our services. Uh, when we talk about moving away from fee-for-service, one of our main objectives, in addition to, frankly, some administrative sim um, simplification, is to find a way to uh, incent value uh, and pay explicit attention to that relationship between quality and cost. Next slide. So what are our priorities around value-based purchasing? Or um, I will say, I think I just covered the first one actually. Um, and we're interested in explicitly rewarding providers uh, when they are able to move the dial on either lowering costs or improving quality, or sometimes maybe even both. Um, we have a number of ways in which uh, we practice value-based purchasing now within main care, and we also have specific goals on how to make sure that we um, continue to move in a direction where we are spending more of our healthcare dollars at main care uh, through value-based purchasing approaches instead of fee-for-service. All right, so you may have heard um, and, and also seen us use a term alternative payment models. Um, so alternative payment models really means alternative to fee-for-service. And when we talk about moving to alternative, alternative payment models, um, that is how we get to value-based purchasing. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about value-based purchasing, I highly recommend this organization you can see the logo at the bottom of the screen, the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network. And they have done really tremendous work to try to get everybody in the whole country on the same page um, with how we define and talk about different um, levels of alternative payment methods. And they define those levels on a continuum. On one end, you have your fee-for-service, whereas we've already discussed there is no link to value in terms of just regular fee-for-service. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we get to population-based payment, 
um, where uh, providers are, are accountable for everything to do with that patient, right? And um, in, in one way, you could look at it as uh, being a very simple payment method, although um, uh, there is certainly risk there, um, but it, it, it is really sort of looked at as um, where we'd like to get to someday uh, in terms of uh, that uh, patient-centered total accountability uh, and looking at um, quality as well as cost. Uh, in between, you know, for the first step after fee-for-service is usually figuring out how to tie at least a portion of payment to performance on quality outcomes, um, and, and then you can uh, go on from there. And I will just, I will note just for context that uh, right now, we are a little bit under 20% uh, of main care dollars that are paid out through alternative payment methods, models, um, and our goal is to double that and get to 40% by the end of 2022. Uh, and the HCP land, they actually, every year, uh, they ask payers to share how they're doing in terms of percentage of payments that go out through APMs. and so. Um, uh, we are participating in that effort, and it's a nice way to benchmark how different states are doing when, and with everybody using the same definitions of, of what these alternative payment models are. All right, so uh, for this round of stakeholder engagement, we are uh, structuring the conversation by discussion topic. Uh, these are the five main discussion topics that we shared with you ahead of the meeting. Um, we have the time set aside to devote about 30 minutes each to each of these discussion topics. Um, and we will be uh, we will be watching the clock. Um, if we end early for a section, we can move on to the next. Uh, if we are going over time in a section, we will cut off the conversation at 30 minutes. But if we have extra time, um, overall, at the end of uh, the session, then we can circle back to an earlier topic uh, to try and ensure that everybody has the opportunity to speak. Um, so, everybody can see the discussion topics there. I don't think I need to read through them, um, but Myers and Stoffer is going to be um, walking through the uh, general topic areas, as well as some ideas for um, uh, subtopics within that area as the conversation kicks off. All right, uh, Myers and Stoffer, do you still want me to cover this slide or are you all covering this slide? Well, we can do either one. In the past, um, David did did this section comfortable covering it? All right, that I can I can jump in and do it. I just wanted to make sure I was following expectations. So, um, so as I noted, Myers and Stoffer will introduce the discussion questions. Um, they'll also make sure that participants are keeping comments within uh, time limits. Um, and that, again, the comments being shared um, are pertinent to the topic under discussion. Um, and that, again, we are recording uh, and will be transcribing the meeting as well. Uh, we do ask that before you share comments, you introduce yourself and also specify um, uh, the services that you provide uh, and section of policy that corresponds to those services. Um, again, we ask that you uh, keep your comments relevant to the specific discussion topic being discussed. Uh, if you have comments that you wanted to share and somebody else has already said the same thing, feel free just to reference the earlier comments that were made and, and that will be noted um, in the notes by Myers and Stoffer uh, so that we, um, we can be efficient with our time and, and don't need to hear the same comments repeatedly. Um, Please respect time limits and uh, and once again um, we are talking about payment methodologies today and not uh, rate amounts themselves. Um, so we'll be posting the recording within 24 hours. Um, I think I've already said everything in the reminders. Uh, just a note that we are working on finalizing dates for the second round of stakeholder engagement, and that will be um, 
in uh, early to mid November. And uh, as a part of that benchmarking report, just to, to note that um, in addition to looking at uh, how rates compare, we're also looking at how payment methods compare. Um, and Myers and Stauffer will also be uh, recommending services as potential candidates for the alternative payment models that I was uh, just speaking to. Um, here is the email address, uh, rate setting eval at main.gov, and that is the email to which you should submit uh, any written comments. All right, so again, uh, I cannot uh, stress enough how um, we are really looking forward uh, to your feedback um, and to the recommendations of this work in general. Um, uh, rates are foundational, obviously, uh, to the services you all provide and to the services members receive uh, in main care. So um, it's, it's very foundational work. Um, and uh, thank you for having me here this afternoon. Um, I am unfortunately not able to stay for, um, for the session, but I look forward to uh, hearing about your input. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for, for introducing this. So we're going to start with the first question and we're going to um, pretend like we're also kids in school and use the raise your hand method. So if you don't know how to raise your hand in WebEx, there is a little hand signal um, that's right next to the one that looks like a megaphone that's for feedback. So the, the one right to the left of that is a hand. And if you mouse over it, it says raise your hand. So I will read the question, give you a few examples, and then um, we'll ask anyone who wants to speak to click the raise your hand, and then Jillian will go through and unmute one at a time um, as we take your comments. Let's see, we have um, one question for a second. Can you post the email address? We will um, post the email address. It's also um, should be in your invitation, and um, it's here again briefly on the screen rate setting eval at main.gov. Once you have been unmuted and given your comment, um, if you could unmark your hand, then that will drop you out of the queue so we know that you're not asking to speak again or you're asking to speak at the next question that you're done with your comments and that helps us keep track of everything, how we're going. So the first question is really asking how the current methodology is working for the services that you provide. Is the methodology transparent and easily understandable? Um, does it create opportunities for efficiency and economy? And probably more, most importantly, does it reflect how you deliver services? So do you typically provide a bundle of services, but you have to bill separately for each of them? Do you bill um, in an increment of time that matches the time in which provide service. So if you're providing a service that is a day, do you have to build in 15 minute increments? So those are this is sort of, this question is trying to understand um, any comments related specifically to how the methodology and how it is working or not working for how you deliver services. So if you'd like to have a comment um, under this question, please feel free to raise your hand. Okay, the first hand I see is for Excellent. Community Care Services at Media Hospital. So for this particular session, I oversee Section 65 um, school-based clinician services. So we've got clinicians that are in schools. So that's what I'm referencing as I'm kind of asking questions or putting out um, comments here. And I met with the clinicians and asked them, we kind of reviewed some of these questions and they do feel that the payment method was transparent, it's understandable, they know what they can bill for. We bill in 15 minute increments. I think some of the feedback that I got um, from them was the billing in 15 minute increments. It, I think one of the questions you asked on here, would it be more um, appropriate to bill 
or when there's an hour or greater would be more appropriate than the 15 minute billing and putting in all the different units. Um, and they felt that would be more helpful and useful to them um, instead of the 15 minute increments for just regular therapy. Um, that was some of the feedback that I got. And I will say, I love the value-based purchasing. I also oversee a BHH program, but I think that's in another session. Um, so that I do and have a lot of positive feedback about that. But for this one, for section 65, they really talked about um, a tiered model would be more uh, appropriate uh, for the service that they provide. The clinicians um, strongly felt that while they just bill the same amount um, for, for each session that they're doing, some sessions are more intense. Um, they use different training in some of them, CBT or CBT, um, but they felt that there would be more value to having a tiered payment model. So I think that's just the, the feedback that I have on this question here. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, next up, I have Maureen. Hi, my name is Maureen Villado. I'm the Director of Children's Services and Case Management at the Progress Center. How are you today? Uh, so my, um, my comment around um, does the methodology reflect how you deliver services? Um, so something that um, um, has come up for us is the, um, the the reimbursement rate affects our ability to hire um, outpatient therapists um, as an employed um, an employee or a contracted position, and um, a lot of the um, non-billable activity that's not reimbursable affects the um, caseloads that our therapists are taking on and um, would like to see if there is a way to include the, for every hour of face-to-face, -face, there's, you know, an hour of non-billable activity and it affects um, the ability um, to compensate outpatient therapists uh, a, a wage that, um, you know, at a higher wage. Um, so we're just wondering if there's a way to bill one rate for face-to-face, -face, and is there an opportunity for a lesser rate for documentation? Okay, thank you so much, Maureen. Um, next, I've got, um, let's see, Ken Olson asked, um, Said he had some issues raising a hand, so I'm going to unmute you now. Uh, you can also, if you have issues raising your hand, type it into the chat, bo chat box and I'll unmute that you that way. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I was just going to echo the comments uh, regarding the ease of billing in hourly units as opposed to uh, as opposed to 15 minute uh, incremental units. And that our team also felt that the methodology, current methodology was, you know, pretty transparent and, and easily, easily understandable. Okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, the next hand I had is for Margaret. Well, hi, I'm Margaret Longsworth. I'm the Director of Mental Health and Clinical Services at OHI. I had a comment about the uh, Section 65 Medication Management Service. We do not provide this service, but we uh, provide a number of other services where people are, are using the Medication Management Service. And I want to echo uh, a previous comment about a tiered model particularly for medication management. We have a number of people who we serve who come out of one of the state psychiatric hospitals with progressive treatment plans. And there doesn't seem to be any real recognition that it's harder um, for medication managers to administer those plans. And it would be great 
if there was some kind of payment incentive for people to do that, because the way it sits now, hardly any of the medication managers will administer the progressive treatment plans, you know, and those people tend to be uh, more challenging. They're, they're people who don't have uh, oftentimes insight into the nature of their illness. They've gone through hospitalization multiple times before they get to that uh, PTP status. And uh, I would just like, uh, uh, the folks that are working on this to take a look at creating that as a category or a tier of service. Um, I also wanted to comment on the outpatient counseling service. Again, we don't provide that service, but what my observation has been uh, over the last probably decade is that the system of care, uh, because of the, the rate amount um, it, it has pushed the system to an affiliate model whereby agencies uh, are often not employing counselors full time and are instead contracting with private clinicians who, you know, they have a few pe people from main care members on their caseload, but they're not having a lot. And I think that creates barriers to services. It also creates a challenge in trying to mentor uh, conditionally licensed clinicians towards full licensure. Um, a lot of the conditionally licensed folks have to end up over at some place like Acadia inpatient. Um, and that's not necessarily the kind of, you know, they, they, they might not want to specialize in inpatient treatment. Um, so it's just an observation that it's pushed our system in a particular direction and it had some consequences. Um, and I will uh, comment on other sections uh, that uh, we provide services for in, seven, in 17 uh, later. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Uh, the next person I had that raised their hand was uh, Patricia McKenzie. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would echo what I'm hearing that the uh, fee for service 50 minute increments. Um, don't really work well for what the practice really is. And if value-based purchasing is all about getting health outcomes and improvement in people's lives, in figuring out what an outpatient hour is, um, we really have to look at what is it that an outpatient clinician does beyond those moments of the actual therapy. You know, for years, many of us have asked about, is there a way to, when we're doing care coordination, because it, we have to do the care coordination. Is there a way for us to bill for that? When we do essential collateral work um, with um, either guardians and others that um, we need to work with or with other stakeholders that it's critical to managing the safety at that low level of care and getting the health outcomes, it's been problematic. So I would look forward to anything that would at least pay for all of the service of what outpatient therapy does, because it is such an important uh, piece of keeping people at the lowest level of care in their communities. Uh, but it's a very hard program to financially support at the way we now reimburse it, both rate and the methodology of how we reimburse. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, the next person I had that raised their hand is uh, Melissa. Hi, this is Melissa Bowker Kinley, um, Medical Director at Health Affiliates Maine, speaking to Section 65 Medication Management. The um, methodology is pretty clear, but the restriction for adult initial psychiatric evaluations to an hour and the documentation burden for initial psychiatric evaluations means that. Oftentimes, clients have to be brought back for a second appointment in order to gather relevant information and history to develop a comprehensive treatment plan. The other real challenge is that the 30 minute restriction for follow up appointments means by and large that you do not have an opportunity to do crisis assessment or be able to meaningfully work with a patient on a crisis plan to keep them out of the hospital. You just do not have the time along with the documentation requirements and you can't really get paid for anything more than 30 minutes. So you often end up referring clients to crisis services or an emergency department, which creates a disjointed care. Um, and it would be really helpful for medication management if there could be um, more flexibility or um, some reduction in documentation requirements that are relatively um, 
irrelevant for psychiatric care um, and don't meaningfully contribute to the, the treatment plan for the patient. Okay, thank you for your comment, Melissa. Um, next up from the chat, I have uh, Matthew Segal. Hi, uh, this is Matthew Siegel from Maine Behavioral Healthcare. I'm the EPMA for uh, Developmental Disorder Services. Um, so, uh, a couple comments. Number one, uh, I would repeat and amplify Dr. Booker Kinley's comment. She just made that greater flexibility is needed in the management uh, uh, service and how it's paid. It's currently paid as simply a 30 minute block. Uh, and that does not allow you to either do a shorter 15 minute appointment or more likely um, there's no way to be paid for an appointment that extends beyond 30 minutes, which it often does in order to provide comprehensive care to complicated uh, patients, such as patients with developmental disorders and other uh, patient populations. So I think looking at um, the methodology of um, why is that only reimbursed in 30 minutes in a single 30 minute increment per day as opposed to perhaps 15 minute increments that could extend as long as is medically necessary would be something to consider. Uh, the next thing um, I know we're not talking about trying not talk about rates. Um, however, uh, um, I think it, it touches on methodology. Uh, currently, the I do not understand the methodology that leads to the reimbursement for a doctoral level psychologist doing psychotherapy, uh, individual or family, uh, is the same. It is equal to that of a master's level clinician, i.e. a social worker, LCPC, et cetera. Um, it is a, whatever your methodology is leads to an equivalent reimbursement rate of, I believe, $84 an hour. That does not make sense by training or level of education. And the result of that has been a near absence of psychologists in the state of Maine who do outpatient therapy um, for and who will take Maine care reimbursement. They essentially do not exist. Um, so that is a major gap in the system. Um, the next one is, um, I don't understand the methodology that leads to reimbursement of speech and OT in outpatient by main care that results in rates that are extremely low um, and create a barrier for services. Um, and uh, finally, um, there, I just want to note that there is no methodology and therefore no reimbursement for um, behavior analysts for Section 65 outpatient service, and thus that service does not exist, and that is a major gap uh, in the system. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Uh, the next person I have up from the chat is uh, Christy. Hi, this is Christy Daggett with um, AMHC in Caribou. Um, my comment goes to outpatient behavioral health services. Um, we would echo what I've heard now many times. Um, we called together a group of clinicians and our billing staff, and uh, the feedback they wanted to share was that uh, therapy is negatively impacted because we count minutes rather than the hour. We are habitually uh, under reimbursed. Also, this is a special consideration for AMHC because we serve between Washington, Hancock, and Aristic, some of the most rural areas of the state. If multiple services have to happen on the same day, one surface, one surface has to be written off, and this really disadvantages providers who are serving clients with travel barriers who have a hard time getting to our offices and they have to get all the services they can while they're able to be served by us. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Um, next I have Dale Hamilton. Hi, thank you um, with Community Health and Counseling Services. Uh, I, so I, I won't repeat um, what's been said um, but I do want to echo a couple of things uh, to a point around, especially medication management. The requirements associated with that um, are significant, and but the reimbursement does not account for that. Um, so looking at that, I agree fully that that restriction of 30 minutes, regardless of need, um, is is inappropriate. And when you talk about trying to get 
um, outcome, um, focus on outcomes, that really restricts the ability to do so. That should be um, something that the um, practitioner is able to determine what is needed and not be forced into a model of reimbursement. Either we don't receive reimbursement and we continue with the right care um, or the care is stopped because of that artificial time frame. So um, that really needs to be looked at. As far as the methodology, again, not getting too far into the rates, but you do need to understand that the, the history of this rate was that it was established long ago with grant funding that um, helped to support the overall service. Over many years, the understanding of how the grant uh, funds were used in establishing the main care rate has been eroded and has been uh, manipulated to a point where it's no longer aligned with the rate. And therefore, um, it's it's really uh, taken what was a, a, a more comprehensive rate um, and really forced it down to a rate that is not sufficient for the service. Um, so if you don't have that historical context, it's extremely important that you ga gather that to understand um, where we were originally with the rate and actually how much it's been reduced because of the change in understanding of the grant. Um, and that methodology then compounds itself in terms of these restrictions that are set. Um, so I think that med management is definitely a potential area to look at uh, value-based purchasing um, in terms of what are what are we looking for out of that service? There, there is a lot to that that's um, put on the practice in terms of obligations and if we really want to make it effective, um, a model that can can allow the service to be delivered the way that it needs to um, would produce better outcomes. But the funding has to support that, and it has to support that model. And and if if we just simply state that it's value based, and here's a here's a, a rate that's not aligned with what's required, um, and doesn't account for it, then you're not really achieving value based. You can say it. Um, but if you're not supporting it with a with a fair rate, um, it doesn't make it possible. Okay, thank you, Dale. Um, next up, I have Pete Plummer. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Pete Plummer. I'm the CEO of Woodbridge Family Services, and I'm going to comment on med management and outpatient services. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a process and in. Uh, remark when there's a lot of work that outpatient clinicians do or med management uh, physicians or physician assistants or psychiatrists do is non-billable and, and a certain high percentage of their time is spent in doing elements of the job that that uh, that are not billable uh, by definition and when the rate is being calculated if it's the model doesn't change i just ask that uh you use the data from providers to know how much of the rate is is non-billable so that a the productivity or the expectation of the hours billed per day for the service is is reasonable you know past efforts you know to do rate setting has led to unobtainable Productivity standards and calculating the rate, which which drives the rate down, uh, and it makes it unaffordable to to do the work. Uh, so, you know, I just ask that you pay attention to what those real standards are, and and uh, factor that into the total cost divided by the billable hours, so that so that the rate is appropriate. Okay, thank you, Pete. Um, next up from the chat, I have um, Luann. Thank you. Uh, this is Luann Rose, uh, patient therapy director from Health Affiliates Maine. I wanted to um, also speak to outpatient therapy uh, and the, the the hours that uh, therapists that are not reimbursable with main care. What we're finding is more and more uh, clinicians are not taking main care or else it's a very small part of their caseload. Um, things like meeting with guardians without the child present, uh, meeting with group home staff, uh, 
IEP meetings at school, collaborative meetings and phone calls, and family team meetings uh, for DHS. These are things they're just not going to. So the quality of client care is is really suffering, and and I believe that uh, we would have better outcomes uh, if we could have the full team working with clients uh, participating. But it's just not uh, not something that's possible under the current rate. Okay, thank you, Luann. Um, next, I have Robert Guerrero. I hope I pronounced that. Yes, I do not have a question. Oh, sorry, I must have. Okay. Um, I don't see any other hands raised then. Um, I did notice there are a few um, call in users. Um, so I'm going to unmute them uh, right now just to allow them to comment if they're unable to raise their hands. Okay. And hearing nothing from the call in users. And not seeing any, oh, I see a couple more raised hands. So let me go back to those. Next up, I've got uh, Jonathan Smith. Hello, yes, I'm Jonathan Smith. I'm a um, counselor at UTP of Maine, um, primarily working in case management. I'm, I'm standing in for our clinical director uh, for outpatient services. Um, so uh, to speak to the bullet points here, uh, we found that uh, the you know, the methodology is, um, you know, is it transparent and easily understandable? We find it straightforward. Um, we actually find um, in, in terms of creating opportunities for efficiency and economy, um, we actually find a strength in the um, main care system is having the opportunity to bill uh, within out, in outpatient services uh, or for outpatient therapy up to two hours a week for higher needs clients. Uh, it's it, that, that is unusual, but it, it affords us the opportunity to provide a higher level of service without having to go to a higher level of care. Um, and um, one, one thing about the delivery of services, much like people have already talked about how certain providers have been, um, you know, dis, you know, the methodology has created distance between some providers engaging uh, main care um, or, or, or not, not engaging main care. Um, we've had that experience with group work. Uh, group work, I think, uh, has has a lot of uh, valid applications and, and the amount of non-billable time that goes into running an effective group uh, or group therapy. Um, there's, you know, the, the rate and the, I, I guess the methodology uh, doesn't support that that kind of work, even though it is um, very, very valuable. So that's uh, one thing to consider. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I have, I think this will be our last comment. I've got Mallory. Yep, thank you. Um, this is Mallory Shaughnessy, Executive Director with the Alliance for Addiction and Mental Health Services. And speaking to the outpatient um, and the methodologies, just a couple of points that I want to make while we're still on this point here is that we've developed these ancillary contracts to try to help uh, sustain some of these rates. And I think Dale alluded to the changes that we've seen in the grant dollars. Um, and, and what happens is because the rates reduce and they're trying to augment it with the ancillary contracts, it actually increases the administrative burden um, and and puts more pressure on the on providing the services and pushing more time, less time to actually provide the services because the the uh, added administrative burden. So just to you know, when you start piecing pieces together like that, um, I, I think as Dale was saying, um, a value based payment that would have the entirety of what is needed could be very helpful. Um, but that that just that added administrative burden from those ancillary contracts can be in, impact. And the other piece I want to just throw out is. You know, the methodology may actually be very good and all the pieces are accounted for in the computations. We've seen that with methodologies that have been used in Maine for rate setting, where, you know, depending on what you put into it, it's a great methodology and it'll come out with a good rate. But the assumptions that go into the methodology is often the, the big key. And that's, I think, something that we need to 
really keep in mind as well as just the actual functional methodology that's being used. I just want to really make sure that we keep that forefront. That's it. Thank you, Mallory. Uh, Julie, I think we're good to head to the next question. Okay, great. Thank you. So just um, wanted to give everyone the heads up if you have raised your hand um, and it's from the last question, we're moving into two. So either unraise your hand or um, leave it raised so that we know that you're asking to speak um, specifically on question number two. And so this is really asking about if you feel the payment um, methodology is creating the right incentives. And we've given a couple of examples, quality access to care, um, primary and preventative care integration, care coordination, um, how members use the services and if it, um, the way it's structured avoids abuse and fraud. And so I get that we're really, we're asking for if it's creating the right incentives, but the other half of that is it creating any disincentive that impacts any of these. And so if you can go ahead and start raising your hands, um, like Jillian had said, if you can't raise your hand, um, chat at us and she will um, unmute you as we move along. Okay, thank you, Julia. Uh, the first person I have here is uh, Matthew. Hi, Matthew Siegel, Maine Behavioral Health Care. Um, I would say the care coordination is uh, uh, the methodology does not support in the sense of uh, neither for physicians or other providers. I'm not aware of any mechanism in the payment methodology that pays for um, contacting and coordinating and collaborating on care, such as a psychiatrist calling up a clinician and discussing a case or vice versa. Um, and that uh, is where you get the value in a lot of cases and where you um, get quality. And so there is, I'm not aware of any payment or incentive to do that work that is um, necessary and is actually an expectation of the regulatory uh, bodies that govern our different disciplines uh, expect that kind of work from us. So that is uncompensated uh, service. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Uh, next here, I have Dale Hamilton. So um, I'd like to just ask a question. Um, if you could clarify, what do you mean by avoidance of abuse and fraud? So, is there anything in the methodology that makes it um, that could make um, incorrect payments happen as a byproduct? I'll give an example of when we were speaking to dentists and they have to pre bundle the way they do services that impact more than one tooth. And so, what they bill for doesn't exactly reflect what's in their medical record. And so, that was one area where they pointed out that there's a disconnect between how we bill and how it looks like in our medical record. And if we inadvertently bundle it incorrectly, then we have um, you know, a, a payment that was filed incorrectly. So that would be an example of that. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would just I would just comment kind of, uh, it's these are all obviously all related and I think we start saying the same things, but um, the, the way that the, the methodology for payment, um, particularly around outpatient and med management, is that it disincentivizes the ability for the providers to be part of um, larger teams and to support individuals the way that they need to be. Um, and so um, we are, as providers, allowing those resources to be, and you heard the comment earlier from someone around attending and supporting group homes and other settings, um, being part of those meetings to, to benefit the individual receiving the care, yet there is zero reimbursement for that. And in fact, um, we, we're capped at that 30 minute time frame. So the, uh, what, we, what we get asked to do and what we need to do for good care um, is not incentivized with the, the current model. Um, and it, even with um, a fair rate, if it's capped at 30 minutes, um, it does not provide that. So uh, I think it's important consideration that um, as you look at this is to to ensure that the, the reimbursement um, process allows for the kind of care that, that we we are delivering um, and need to continue to deliver. Okay, thank you. 
Um, next, I have uh, Melissa. Hi, so I um, want to just reflect this for uh, child and uh, for uh, med management section 65 uh, echoing the points of uh, Dr. Siegel as well about the care coordination just not being funded in any meaningful way. Um, in particular, one of the challenges is with children in the child protective system. There's no payment for psychiatrists to participate in family team meetings. Um, and this is probably our most vulnerable population of children to be able to provide appropriate uh, safe psychiatric care, and yet we're having to either use our own time or uh, not participate in really essential family team meetings. Um, and so it makes it hard to accept these patients because do you want to give less than high quality care or do you want to have unfunded care? Uh, the second care coordination piece that is really um, Medicare and commercial insurances pay for collaborative care codes so that psychiatric providers can collaborate on the care of primary care patients with PCPs um, at times being able to extend the ability of primary care providers to provide mental health treatment and psychiatric treatment to their patients, but also to be able to really uh, catch problems before they become significant in the current payment model right now. There is no uh, funding for that and no ability. So essentially what you say to primary care providers is, well, just send them to me and I guess I'll see them and figure out if they really need to see me. Um, so there's a there's a misuse of psychiatric care that could have been better provided at the primary care level if we had funding for collaborative care between primary care and psychiatry. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up, I've got Jonathan Smith. Uh, hello again. Um, so, I actually, uh, I guess it kind of ties into quality of care, but I, I, I it got to thinking that this point might tie uh, better into that first point about bundling. Um, so, in thinking about uh, outpatient therapy, and, and you know, everything kicks off with the outpatient assessment. Um, we're often depleting that two hours that we get. Uh, approved for assessment, and then we start dipping into the, the therapeutic, um, you know, authorization and things like that. So it kind of creates, uh, I guess, a burden in, in tracking and and um, and also feeling like your time is limited in, in generating a really good assessment. So, uh, so I think that speaks to the prior point about bundling. So, so moving forward into this, the second question around quality of care. Um, you know, and maybe sticking with the point around assessment um, to Dr. Siegel's point about psychologists having been disincentivized to participate in main care. Um, I, that, that makes a lot of sense. I've, I've seen that as well. And then I would I would add too. there's this there's this point around where, you know, to speak to psychological services where they can where psychologists can be paid for the time spent in report writing and um, and, and that is not the case for master's level clinicians and, and all, you know, all things considered equal, you know, recognizing that, you know, there are differences in training and level of education. That's not to say a master's level clinician can't generate a really sound, you know, clinical formulation and, and a really sound assessment and that can really generate some good treatment. So um, is there any way that master's level clinicians could also be uh, reimbursed for their time spent report writing because again to do a good outpatient assessment and to know that we're only uh, able to bill for two hours um, that doesn't you know that doesn't leave a lot of time to do a, a you know a really great biopsychosocial assessment and then and then if you've used that whole two hours sitting with a client and their family um, and, and or any other collateral contacts that would make sense to to include in your assessment. Um, then, if you've used that two hours, then any other time beyond that is, um, I, I guess, essentially non-billable in terms of, you know, assessment hours. So, so that's that's one thing I guess about quality of care. I think the other thing too is that, um, the, you know, the payments currently do not support training, consultation, and supervision, or even data collection, so we can track fidelity uh, to evidence-based practice models. Um, and, you know, it, we've seen this here at the agency, just people leaving for, um, you know, private practice to avoid the lower pay and administrative burden of serving main care clientele. Um, as for access to care, uh, 
you know, I think we've all seen long waiting lists, um, in, especially in counties where it's extremely difficult to recruit staff. Uh, so it'd be great if we can consider differential rates or stipends so agencies could afford to offer incentives to recruit and retain staff in these areas, in these underserved areas. Uh, as for care coordination, um, you know, all the evidence-based practices that we're, you know, we're seeking to be trained in and seeking to deliver, uh, emphasize teamwork and collaboration. Uh, and unfortunately, this, isn't, this hasn't been reimbursable since uh, I, I think the 90s. Um, so this really hurts uh, a clinician's ability to be able to participate in team meetings and collaborate. Um, and so, you know, we, we say we want coordination, but it, it remains uh, not billable. And that's a huge barrier. Um, and then, you know, how members use services. I think for us, when, when we considered this question, uh, the idea of concurrent services came to mind for us. And I think there's been times uh, recently where it hasn't been entirely clear about, you know, say if a, if a client could have, uh, I, I don't want to jump, you know, uh, sections here. I know we're talking about outpatient services, but like if somebody could do HCT services or, or have day treatment, uh, you know, concurrently, there's been confusion around that. It's kind of gone back and forth. So I think it, that's, you know, that's been disruptive to families. It's been disruptive to programs and how we operate them. So, you know, just moving forward, clarity around those things and and um, and, and consistency. I think uh, in in communicating about all those things would be really helpful. So uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have. Uh... Uh, Pete, are you there? Great. Is this Pete Plummer? Hi, yes. It's my turn. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't hear, hear my name. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to touch on something. This is Pete Plummer from Woodford's uh, again. I want to talk, touch on med management and the how members use the service. And it's a special population that needs medication management services. And one of the things that I see is a, is a lot of no-shows, you know, for the service. And uh, and recently we've had the ability to use telehealth. And and I think it's a model that's helped that a bit. And because the no-shows will continue to be a problem. We schedule them and it gets into, you know, if they don't show maybe enhancing the use of telehealth beyond the uh, civil emergency or, or, or beyond for this service or, or, or other services that might have transportation issues or or no-show problems, uh, you know, to be able to, you know, ensure that they're getting the services that they need because there's lots of reasons why there's no-shows, but, you know, we try to call and confirm that and, and it just, it's just a difficult, uh, you know, it's, a, it's difficult for us to, to manage that. And I think for all providers to manage the, the no-show population. And I think telehealth has helped that a bit and there may be other things too, but if you can consider that when you're developing uh, rates or, or processes, that would, be, that would be much appreciated. Okay, thank you, Pete. Uh, next, I've got Margaret. Well, hi, this is Margaret Longstreth from OHI again. I just want to say, and this applies to all the services that we're talking about today, when the payment methodology doesn't keep pace with increasing costs, you know, due to wage pressures, increases in minimum wage, increases in overhead, health insurance, things of that nature, um, you begin to see an erosion of the integration of care and care coordination because the pressure to have uh, employees produce more billable units of service, you know, that goes up and it cuts into the time that they might otherwise be doing that um, care coordination. I think it also increases risks for fraud and abuse as uh, providers start to cut corners just to keep going. Um, and so I'd really like to see some kind of rate setting methodology developed that has some kind of automatic uh, increasing component in it so that we don't have to go for 
half a decade or more in some cases without having any any real meaningful adjustments to the payment amounts. Okay, thank you, Margaret. Um, uh, next from the chat, I've got Jillian. Uh, <laughs> Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Sorry, I jumped on late. So if we're on 65 outpatient therapy, you can give me a nod. <laughs> okay. Jump. I've heard a lot of what other people said. Uh, some of my contribution is um, obviously, as everyone said, long wait lists due to clinical shortages. Um, turn. Uh, there's a lot of turnover due to the stringent uh, main care guidelines as compared to private insurers. A lot of clinicians come and maybe come from private practice or go back to private practice, but we're constantly um, competing with a loss of clinicians due to the high paperwork requirement. Um, we also uh, have struggles with clinicians executing paperwork requirements while balancing clinical sessions uh, due to productivity, um, which is all directly tied into rates. Um, so clinicians also require higher level benefit packages than, and than most other professionals. Uh, so obviously it ties back there. Um, patient no-shows are, are a huge problem, like Pete said, and cancellations at the last minute are just not engaging. Uh, we have found telehealth, just like Pete said, um, to hopefully be a permanent fixture because we are getting better engagement and productivity um, with that measure. Um, it, like others have said on the call, there is no reimbursement for care uh, coordination or integration of care. So, like, if we have to make an external referral or we have uh, we can't take place in team meetings, um, uh, none of that extra activity outside of uh, counseling is is reimbursed. Um, another thing I didn't hear anybody say is this is the service that has the highest level court subpoenas. Um, for child abuse neglect, um, we see it quite frequently, and then clinicians will miss a substantial amount of work um, to have to attend to a subpoena from something that um, came out during a therapy session and as a result of a direct report. So um, it's it that demand and uh, is is high for a very low um, court fee that they get, um, and then there's of course no reimbursement mandating reporting training requirements that these clinicians undergo um, and and they tend to make more referrals um, in our organization than any other service um, and also it's um, I do feel that this would this could potentially be set up nicely a, a good value-based model currently it's not necessarily tied to any sort of value outcome Okay, thank you. Let's see, I believe that is all the hands I am seeing. Okay, great. Um, if we could advance to the next question. And just to remind everyone in case um, it wasn't clear, we are doing all services together. We're organized by question. So when we get to each question, we're, you know, that's why we're asking you to let us know what service you provide. So anyone is um, free to jump in. This one is really looking at equitable payment methodologies. There's been a few comments um, about this topic a little bit, but if you're looking at the services um, within your service area, the providers within your service area, are fees determined and updated at equitably among um, the provider groups? Is there a similar administrative burden and any incentives for quality and access? Um, Bottom line are all or most providers within your service area treated equitably in terms of payment methodology. So, if you would like to make a comment, um, as we've been doing, go ahead and put up your hand or chat at us and Jillian will unmute. Okay, I'm not seeing any um, hands or chat for this. Oh, never mind, just got one. Uh, Mallory. 
Hi, am I up yet? Okay. So just a couple of points here um, from some conversations we've had. Again, I'm with the Alliance for Addiction and Mental Health Services. And uh, when we met the other day, a couple of things when we look at um, uh, so sort of the administrative burden, and it's it's not really been you know fully discussed, but the um, being able to sort of track time in various sections of services in similar ways, so that um, clinicians that might be doing a couple different services or um, having you know different things that they're in charge of each day can track in the same way. So sort of being able to track across sections uh, similarly as opposed to um, you know having it vary tremendously. Um, so that's one piece. And then just the, the um, uh, sort of adult versus children and methodology creating the rates that really, it's sort of been alluded to, but really addresses the very different um, worlds that they live in. So children that are in school that can only come so many times if you've got, you know, intensive outpatient, but, uh, or, you know, MAT, they can only do so much. Um, uh, you know, in their hours of school, you're limited to access to them, but being able to have it more flexible so that the adults versus children really um, are, are, you know, there's that flexibility between the two that you really account for their different worlds that they, that they work with. Is it Okay, thank you. Uh, the next comment I have from is uh, Blanca. Yes. <clears throat> Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes. I can hear me. <laughs> that is kind of weird. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the comments that I want to make is that the current uh, mental health system doesn't count for different levels of care. Outpatient therapy and psychiatry are seen as everybody coming from the inpatient units, everybody coming from our teams, they all go to outpatient regardless of the level of intensity that is required. The payment is the same, the time limitations are the same, and it does not promote quality and it does not promote, promote access. If I am a provider, I'd rather stick to my client that doesn't show up than seeing a new client because of all the administrative burden. Also, if I want to uh, provide quality care, I am forced to do all these other things that are not um, paid for. So I, what I will uh, advocate is for a bundle of care for those more intensive um, care, Clients that require more care because of the complexity, those clients with PTP, those clients that require not only therapy, psychiatry, and case management, but all three, and, and that we stop uh, this uh, silo treatment that does not produce, produce good quality or good outcomes. And uh, having a bundle of care will be very, very beneficial. Also, having really a level of care where if there is no outpatient level of care, maybe we need to create other levels of care within behavioral health. That's my comment. Okay, thank you, Blanca. Um, next, I've got uh, Margaret. Hi again, Margaret from OHI. I'm commenting on section 17, uh, skills development services at this point. Um, in terms of it being the payment methodology being different than other groups of providers, it's not that uh, we as skills development providers are treated differently than other people who provide skills development, but in comparison to other services, the authorization process for persons um, who are not diagnosed with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder are very onerous and you have to jump through multiple hoops in order to get the documentation required to get the services authorized, where that is not required for uh, many other services. Um, it creates significant barriers in access uh, to services for people who really need them. Um, additionally, the time limits imposed on skills development, either the 90 day and one year, 
there are additional requirements inserted there for justification for continued authorization that don't seem to be applied to other services and uh, again create you know barriers to, to access of care and increased administrative burdens uh, the quarter hour billing can you still hear me yes okay. we can Something just happened to my screen. The quarter hour billing um, for this service, generally speaking, is fine. But what we do observe is that when the service recipient doesn't need uh, a large block of service, let's say they only need 15 minutes or a half an hour, uh, the travel time associated with that is not uh, adequately covered within the rate and that's you know you don't have that if you're an outpatient and somebody is coming to you so so there are just some differences there as well thank you okay margaret uh let's see i don't I thought i had a hand i think i i don't have any more hands oh here we go melissa yeah, so um, I just want to speak to the um, equity issue with regard to um, reflecting what Blanca said, um, particularly when you're working with kids with uh, autism and developmental disabilities for whom collaboration with uh, um, BCBA through school, if kids are in day treatment, that requires a great deal of work and well beyond what can be accomplished in 30 minutes. Those children are much more complicated than, for instance, uh, a nine year old with relatively simple controlled ADHD who's been on the same meds for a year. Um, the the difference and yet you can get paid the same for um, probably two to three times as much work. And I think that um, really the methodology at this point doesn't really reflect the level of skill, level of difficulty and the the need for coordination in order to make the care a quality care. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Melissa. I am not seeing any more hands here, Julia. Okay, great. Um, so moving on to the next question. Peter, strange things are happening. Can you see the can you see the screen? No, we just see it grayed out. Now? Yes, um, so our next question is, and um, some of you have already mentioned that you feel like your service might be a good candidate. Um, is really on value based purchasing um, and administrative requirements. So is the methodology consistent with value based purchasing? Is it consistent with any other value based purchasing approaches that you have in place through other pairs? Um, are there administrative requirements um, that are placed on you that are burdensome. I know you guys have already mentioned several of them. Um, so I think for for this question, if you could more focus on the number four bullet and up number five bullet, um, are there any value-based purchasing approaches that you have in place through other pairs? Um, and, and maybe some recommendations if you definitely think that your service might benefit from that. Any information you could provide about how you think that might look, I think that would be um, really great for this question. Okay, uh, Mallory, is your hand up from the last question? Uh, yep, I think it was. <laughs> No problem. Okay, I'm not seeing any um, hands up. On these questions, um, since there are some call in users, I am going to just unmute them just in case I missed their hands or anything. Okay, and hearing nothing from the call-in users. I do have uh, 
a couple things from the chat box, so let me move on to those. Uh, first, I've got uh, Blanca. Yes, I just want to notice that uh, we are required to get um, reauthorization via Kipro. It's very seldom that those are um, denied. Because most of the time the clients meet medical necessity. We know that uh, people don't recover within three months or even within three, six months. And yet we have to request authorization for services that often, uh, even though the authorization is good for a year, the number of units allocated are, are, are minimum, uh, especially for outpatient therapy. We see clients weekly before we transition them to twice a month or even monthly. And the same thing is for um, psychiatry. We need we need to have less of that uh, frequency where we request reauthorization to Kipro. Okay, thank you, Blanca. Uh, next from the chat, I've got um, Ken Olson. Hi, that's uh, Ken Olson from uh, Kids Peace. And you know, I think the reason that you're not getting a lot of comments here is that value-based purchasing, the devil's in the details with respect to how value is defined. And, and so in, in my experience anyway, the principles of value-based purchasing are really based on what kind of outcomes you're hoping to achieve. And it would be my hope that as you guys look to value-based purchasing, that you involve the provider community in determining what those sets of outcomes uh, are, 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 going to, are going to look like. Uh, thank you, Ken. Next, I've got Melissa. Yeah, so um, two pieces, and I know you asked us not to talk about the administrative requirements, but I do think I want to bring up just one piece, which is that the 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 dual eligibility. So the fact that um, patients have to be fully discharged in Kipro from their previous psychiatric provider who may have only been an MAT provider and actually not a psychiatric provider before they can see their new provider means that we are often spending the first 15 minutes of a psychiatric appointment on the phone with the client with Kipro directly, you know, confirming that they are actually discharged from their previous provider cutting into that 60 minute window. We, this is the only insurance that we have to do that with, and it really does effectively cut into um, relationship building and really appropriate assessment time with the patient. The other issue is that um, commercial insurance insurances, including Anthem, do have um, they do have contracts with mental health providers. I'm actually in one with a primary care practice that I'm in that uh, pay based on collaboration and quality and communication, but their payments above and beyond the typical payment. So part of what they do is they reimburse above for when clients meet bench clients uh, care meets benchmarks based on the uh, level of improvement as well as documentation of uh, collaboration between the the mental health practice and the primary care provider. Those are all reasonably easy to obtain, and those should be something that main care can think about. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Uh, next, I have uh, Mallory. Hi. Um, so I, I think I would, you know, definitely echo what was just stated. I think that's a key point. Uh, but to kind of go back again to Ken Olson, since he brought that up about the issue of what you're valuing and how you're measuring that, I would really hope to have a thorough conversation and do some some research across the country because too often behavioral health value based. Um, services are based on medical um, outcomes and not um, behavioral health outcomes. And I think we've seen that consistently across uh, across the country, but there are new ones being developed that are really based back to what are the quality outcomes of the behavioral health that you're working on itself. Um, so just really want to stress that. Um, thank you, Ken, for bringing that up. I was going to kind of hold off on that, but since you said it, <laughs> I really want to make sure that you understand that's a, a critical piece. We need new new ones. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mallory. Next, I've got uh, Jonathan. 
Yes, hi. Um, I think uh, I, I would agree. Well, I I totally agree with what was just said, um, and would really emphasize that it has to be something that we as behavioral health providers can impact. And so I think that you know when we we think. Uh, this is, this is going to draw on my experiences from another section of main care and in, in behavioral health homes. Um, one of the. One of the outcome measures that we are evaluated on. Really, um, you know, really is outside of our control in a lot of ways. Um, and and so I think that moving forward, if, you know, if we're going to talk value based purchasing for for section 65 and, and you know, patient services that it, that it really be something that. The, uh, the clinician or provider and and client or patient can impact together in, in their working relationship. Or if it's some measure of integration and collaboration, that's a great idea too. I love that. Um, but uh, but it really has to be something that you know providers can be uh, can, can affect in their day to day. That's it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing any more raised hands or anything in the chat box, Julia. Okay, great. Um, Peter, can you move to the, I think it's the last slide. Right, so um, just to remind everyone, if you um, were thwarted by technology and you want to send us a written comment, this is the email to do it. I did want to um, open up to make sure if there is something that you feel is like really important for us to know that we haven't talked about, um, but you would like to make sure that um, we think about that in the report, um, please don't hesitate to raise your hand right now um, and say something or um, send us an email at the email address that's on the screen. I think we have a question. Um, so the there will be links posted um, for the recording up on um, the main Carol website. Um, Jillian, I don't know if do we have the or, or someone from main care has the exact um, address of where those will be posted. They'll be up within 24 hours. Um, Yep, this yep. is Sarah. I can um, drop the link in the chat if that helps. That would be great, Sarah. So if anyone else, um, please raise your hand if you feel like there's anything else you want to tell us before um, we wrap up the meeting. We, I do want to thank everyone for coming and spending part of your busy day um, to give us information and we truly do appreciate it and we'll be um, factoring in your comments as we make recommendations to, um, to the department. Just checking. It doesn't look like anyone else has anything they would like um, to say. Are you seeing anything in chat or anything, Julie? I am not. Um, I did just want to mention, you know, while we're locating that link, that um, it's all posted on YouTube on the Main Care Comms channel. That's where, that's where the videos will be posted. Oh, it looks like Mallory has raised her hand. Do you want to mute? Okay, Mallory, you're muted. Yeah, I was just, I was looking earlier for the videos from yesterday and I could not find the comms channel. And I don't know if I was just not getting there, but can you send the link to where? Hi, Mallory, this is Sarah. I just dropped um, the rate system evaluation webpage into the chat. We are actually linking to the videos from there as well, just to have a kind of one stop place for all of the information. Um, I think it was posted late morning, so we may have just been a little early. Okay, so there will be on there. Okay, thanks. And I just dropped the YouTube um, 
channel for their problems as well. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you again all so much for joining us. I hope you have a great um, rest of your day and um, we really appreciate you taking time today.